So I'm here to speak to you. I'm going to go ahead and just um, mention a couple things that are coming up here in the next couple weeks. Um, one being the Bible study. So that's coming up here February 8th, 10 a.m. Um, again, if you want some more information on that, I'm going to direct you to Pastor Don that He's leading the charge on that. But if you can't make it, of course, that's going to be on our Facebook page. Um, if you need a new Zion telephone directory or the February newsletter, we mentioned this last week, but those are out in the narthex in those wire baskets. So feel free to snag some of those. Um, and then two more things that are not listed in the bulletin. One, if we can send lots and lots of love and prayers to Abby June right now, who's recovering from some injuries from a car accident. Um, if we can go ahead and send her lots of love, call, all that kind of stuff, just to make sure she's healing up as good as possible. And then last thing, to end on a really happy note, because I can't forget about her enough, but my grandma just retired from 60 years of service at B.E. Peterson, so I wanted to give her a round of applause there. Poppy can't go to the casino as much anymore, so he's a little upset. <laughs> Other than that, though, let's go ahead and prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
pick up with uh, talking about uh, some things from the book of Job. And, uh, you know, come and join us, by golly. And, uh, uh, or if you, if you can't use the material, take a look at it. Uh, uh, glad to have you involved, okay? So, uh, other than that, uh, as I said, it's good to worship with you. Uh, we're together as what we're doing with God had in mind, calling us together to be people of God to, uh, uh, to take care of each other, help each other, encourage each other, uh, give each other strength. So, And because of that, we worship because the Holy Spirit calls us together as the people of God. And this, of course, includes all the folks who are watching our videos as well. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you always.
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. Lord God, with endless mercy you receive the prayers of all who call upon you. By your Spirit, show us the things we ought to do, and give us the grace and power to do them, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning, everyone. So when Julia sang this little light of mine at Vacation Bible School, they had the lights turned off and a flashlight on to show that Jesus is the light. So if you guys have cell phones that have lights, why don't you go ahead and get them out? Let's pretend like this is a concert. There you go. Why do we fast, but you do not see? 
Why humble ourselves so you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to lose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked, to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. The word of the Lord. Please read responsibly from Psalm 112, verses 1 through 9. Hallelujah! Happy are they who fear the Lord and have great delight in God's commandments. Wealth and riches will be in their house, and their righteousness will last forever. It is good for them to be generous in lending and to manage their affairs with justice. They will not be afraid of any evil rumors. Their heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. They have given freely to the poor, and their righteousness stands fast forever. They will hold up their heads with honor. Our second reading is from the first book of Corinthians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Though people such as the Corinthians are enamored with human philosophy and wisdom, Paul continuously presents God's hidden wisdom, which is Jesus Christ crucified. True spiritual maturity involves judging ourselves and others in light of God's revelation in the cross. And now the reading. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet among the mature we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age, or of the rulers of this age, who are doomed to perish. But we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceive, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what human being knows what is truly human, except the human spirit that is within? So also no one comprehends what is truly God, except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. The Word of the Lord. Please stand in preparation for the gospel.
First of all, I want to thank Julia for saying that, for bringing your mom along. Hallelujah. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light of life. The Holy Gospel, according to Matthew. Oh, last week we read the attitudes from Matthew. Well, these are some words out of the Sermon on the Mount that uh, follow the Beatitudes, where Jesus encourages his uh, disciples, obviously, to do what he said in the Beatitudes, and is such to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, doing good works and keeping God's commandments. This is what Jesus said. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The gospel of the Lord. Grace and mercy and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. The late Los Angeles Dodgers pitcher Don Sutton hadn't won a game in eight weeks. A critical press was suggesting that he be dropped from the starting lineup. The future looked pretty bleak. And he felt terrible. Then before a game, Dodgers manager Walter Austin tapped him on the shoulder. I'd like to speak with you, Don, he said. Well, such prepared for the worst. Don said, Olson, I know that how the past months have been for you. Everybody's wondering whether we're going to be able to make it to the playoffs. You know, there's a lot of pressure. I, I've had to make a, I have made a decision. Sutton had visions that he was going to be taken off to the mound. He was ready for it. Then Alston continued, if the Dodgers are going to win this year, he said, looking Sutton in the eye, they're going to win with Don Sutton pitching. How much pay you're staying in the starting job? That's all I want to say. For all Sutton's losing streak lasted another two more weeks. But because of his 
manager's encouragement, he started feeling different about it. Something inside of him was turning around. He found him, he found himself pitching his best ball of his career. In the National League pennant drive, he won 13 out of 14. There are all kinds of theories about how to motivate people. We can do it through guilt, we can do it through fear, we can do it through shame. But these are not Jesus' methods. Jesus motivated through positive messages of hope and encouragement. Consider the gospel lesson for today. Jesus says to his followers, you, you guys, you are the light of the world. Can you imagine that? Here's this motley group crew of farmers and fishermen and tax collectors and housewives in a, a tiny remote village in the, some obscure part of the world. And Jesus is saying to them, you are the light of the world. Talk about a statement of faith. Well, let's, let's go a little further. Talk about the crazy idea. Light of the world? That bunch? must have sounded absurd at the time, even to them. Only Jesus could have seen that through, through this motley crew, God would indeed change the world forever. At the time, however, it probably sounded like so much idle chatter. You are the light of the world, he said. And so they were. And what is more, so are we. So are we. Indeed, Jesus says, you and I, we, we are the light of the world. Think about that for a moment. What does it mean that you and I are the light of the world? Well, let me suggest some possibilities from, from the text. First of all, it means that we have a responsibility for the world. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? We are the light of the world. Okay, what does the light do? A lighthouse? steers ships away from the rocks. A light bulb lights up the room. Light does not exist for its own glory, but to brighten up the world. Years, years ago, there was a young man who had been left blind in both eyes by a childhood accident. In 19th century France, when this young man lived, blind children had little help and few hopes. But then a kind priest, Father Jean Collier, took an interest in the lad. He was amazed by, by the boy's intelligence, by the boy's eagerness to learn. And so with his parents' permission, Father Pillai enrolled the boy in the Royal Institute for Blind Youth in Paris. Thrust into this new and frightening environment, the boy was lonely, he was depressed. In 
town, however, he, he found friendship, he found encouragement. Unfortunately, he was frustrated by the Institute's lack of books that had raised print. He also found that the symbols of raised print were very confusing. So he set out at 12 years of age, just 12 years old, to invent his own system. After three years, he perfected the method, but he encountered all sorts of indifference and even hostility when he tried to convince the world that his system was better. Even with the support of the Institute's director, he was told again and again that he was too young to have created a workable alphabet for the blind. Years passed, and it was not until he lay in his bed dying of tuberculosis that he heard that the first steps were being taken to popularize his system. And though he did not live to witness it, Louis Braille's alphabet became the universal method for reading for the blind. Louis Braille became light for those whose physical eyes had failed them. How wonderful it is when someone sets out to make our world a better place. And dear friends, that is our challenge, yours and mine as Christians, each one of us. It is also a crucial, crucial challenge as our church, the whole church, faces a shortage of clergy and, and volunteers of all kinds. We are the light of the world. We have a responsibility to the world. And then secondly, we also have something that the world desperately needs. That's the second thing Jesus is saying when he says that we are the light of the world. We have something that the world cannot find anywhere else. Mother Teresa was speaking to persons who had come to meet her from all over the world. And after her talk, she asked if there were any questions. Yes, I have one. The woman sitting near the front said, As you know, most religious groups resented here have been losing members. And yet, your order is attracting thousands upon thousands. What, what do you do? How do you do it? And without hesitating for a moment, Mother Teresa said, I give them Jesus. Yes, I know, said the woman. But take habits, for example. Do your women object to the wearing habits, habits and the rules of the order. How do you do it? I give them Jesus, Mother Teresa replied. Yes, I know, Mother, said the woman, but can you be more specific? I give them Jesus, Mother Teresa replied again. Mother, said the woman, we are, are all aware of your fine work. I want to know about something else. Mother Teresa said quietly, I give them Jesus. There is nothing else. 
What do we have? You and I. The world can't find anywhere else. All we have really is the person of Jesus. We, you and I, have been called to be welcoming, to be worshiping, to be working as faithful people for one reason, to make Christ known. Now you and I both know that we live in a world where the majority of our neighbors have little interest or little allegiance to Christianity. Is there anything that we can give to this world that will make any kind of difference at all? Rather than complain about how bad our world is, let me suggest that we do what Mother Teresa did. Let's give him Jesus. In him, God has shown us how he intends our lives to be lived. In him is forgiveness and acceptance, joy and happiness, purpose and peace. It's just as, as Lauren and Julia sang. Let your little light shine. You and I have a responsibility to our world. And in Christ, in Him, in what He has shown us and called us to do and be, we have something that the world can't find anywhere else. And it brings us to one last thing to be said. You always got to remember that we are not the source of the light, but we are reflectors of a much greater light. There is one who has touched our lives and given us the power and the authority to touch others. Eric Butterworth once told about a college professor who had his sociology class go to the Baltimore slums to get case histories of 200 young boys. The students were, were asked to write an evaluation of each boy's future. And in every case, the students wrote, he doesn't have a chance. 25 years later, another sociology professor came across that earlier study, and he had his students follow up on the project to see what had happened to those boys. And with the exception of 20 boys who had moved away or who had died, the students learned that 176 out of the remaining 180 had achieved extraordinary success as lawyers, doctors, and businessmen. The professor was astounded, and he decided to pursue the matter a little further. Fortunately, all these men were were in the area, and he was able to ask each one, how do you account for your success? And in each case, the reply came with very strong feeling. There was a teacher. The teacher was still alive, so he taught her out. And he asked the elderly, but still alert, woman, what magic formula she had used to pull these boys out of the slums into successful achievement. 
The teacher's eyes sparkled and her lips broke into a gentle smile. It's really very simple, she said. I love those boys. No wonder those boys succeeded. Their teacher loved them. Once there was a teacher who also loved his students. He saw possibilities in them that no one else saw in them. He saw possibilities in them that they didn't see in themselves. You are the light of the world, he said to them. And so they became. The love they received from him, they passed on to others. Today there is no place in this world that the light they received from him doesn't shine. Oh, I know because of fierce persecution, it is sometimes only a flame flicker. Sometimes because of the weakness and, and pettiness of his followers, the fire is uncertain and it's tentative, but it still glows. And now it's your possession and mine. We are the light of the world. Years ago, Three young men decided to hop a slow-moving freight train on, on the south end of the town in the, the Pacific Northwest. It was supposed to be a lark on a spring evening. The train was barely moving. As the three, three friends rode down the rails, the locomotive started to pick up speed. And before these friends knew it, they were doing about 40 miles an hour, and they had left the city. The darkness was setting in out there in the boondocks. So these three friends were cold and lost and scared. After a half an hour or so, they, they decided they had to do something. So they lined up at the door of the boxcar and they were riding in and they bailed out. It was a rough tumble into some bushes, but they were okay. The problem was they were terribly lost. It was pitch dark. Eventually one of them looked off in the darkness and they, they, they saw a, a faint glow, a faint glow, very faint, faint glow. Looked like there was a small town out there. The three humiliated joy riders began walking through the woods. With each step, the light became brighter and more distinct. There was a town out there. And soon the light became intense enough to illuminate their path. They wound up at a roadside restaurant and called for help. These friends got home safely because they saw a distant light and walked in its glow. It became an overwhelming beacon that led them to where they needed to go. I don't think I'm being overly dramatic when I say that there are people in our world who are lost in the darkness and are looking for a light, any light, to lead them to spiritual and emotional and mental safety. How about your light? Is it shining? Could they find their way home because of you? 
You and I are the light of the world. Remember, we, we heard Lord and Julius sing about it. We heard Jesus talk about it. We have a responsibility for our world. We have, we really have what our world desperately needs because God gave it to us in Jesus. We are not the source of the world. Never was, never will be. But we are that light's reflection. Reflectors of the true light of Jesus Christ. So then, my dear friends, Let your light so shine. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
that the barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatred cease, and that, with our divisions healed, we might live in justice and peace. Merciful God, inspire our wonder at creation, from the light of the dawn to the beauty of the dark night. Sustain the unseen depths of the ocean to the plants and animals we know well. Bring healing to lands and communities experiencing natural disasters. Merciful God. Lord, keep this nation under your care. Bless the leaders of our land, that we may be a people at peace among ourselves and a blessing to other nations of the earth. Help us elect trustworthy leaders, contribute to wise decisions for the general welfare, and thus serve you faithfully in our generation to the honor of your holy name. Merciful God. Lord God, your Son came among us to serve and not to be served, and to give his life for the world. Lead us by his love to serve all those to whom the world offers no comfort and little help. Through us, give hope to the hopeless, love to the unloved, peace to the troubled, and rest to the weary. Merciful God. Shape our congregation to be salt for the earth. Give us delight in your commandments that we are generous with those in need. Make us steadfast in our trust in you, ready with tangible mercy and compassion for our neighbors. Merciful God. The cross and resurrection bring redemption from sin and death. We praise you for all those unshaken faith in Christ shines forth in their witness. Keep them in our remembrance and bring us with them into the kingdom of heaven. Merciful God. We bring to you our needs and hopes, O oh God, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then, in the same manner, after he had supped, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink you all of it. This is my blood of the covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
this do is in remembrance of me as often as you drink. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray.
Now may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his precious blood strengthen and preserve you unto eternal life. Amen. Holy One, we thank you for the healing that springs forth abundantly from this table. Renew our strength to do justice, love kindness, and to journey humbly with you. Amen. God blesses us and sends us in mission to the world. Now may the God who faithfully brings forth justice and breaks the oppressor's rod bless, strengthen, and uphold you today and always. Amen.